you now. All right. Should be live. I'm just gonna turn that off there so it's not messing with my um audio. Just gonna do a quick check-in to make sure that we are live. Looks like everything is working okay. And then hopefully somebody can let me know here shortly that our audio is good. Love this. Nothing like in being in Mildura going to New Zealand to talk about California makes yep. makes perfect sense to me. So that's the way that it <laughs> that's the way that it rolls. Um, so I'm pretty sure that every, everything's working audio wise anyway. Gwenny Bradford, so this is what I love about us starting this time of the day, uh, Jonathan, because um, Gwen Bradford is um, well, she was she's the wife of the great big chap Noel Bradford. She was the yep. proud mum of Ian Bonza Bradford. Uh, and I always call her the queen of uh, of Balladu. Uh, so she's tuned in watching this morning as well. So uh, wonderful to have so many people already tuning in uh, to watch this. We're going to be talking about the Peter Murphy Classic. Now, Jonathan Allard and I have talked forever about being able to do this since COVID, really. Finally, four years later, we're doing it. It's good to see you, mate. It's good to be on. I uh, always love your work, and, and it's pretty special to have you uh, have me on and be a part of this. Right back at you, mate. I love the Dalton shirt. You're right across it. What is Dalton's? Because obviously it's all over your race cars and it was all over Murph's race cars. What is Dalton's? Uh, Dalton's is a family-owned company that uh, that does a lot of mulch and, and bag mulch that's in like uh, Bunnings and, and Mitre 10 down here. And um, really it was started from a great family, that, that the Dalton family that, uh, started basically from a bag and a shovel and some sand and, and they've grown this thing into the corporation it is. And, and it's a really neat family to be a part of. They know all their employees' names, all the partners, all the kids. Um, and it's quite expansive, but it's a tight knit group and it's definitely special to be a part of it. Murph is actually tuned in and watching. So so let's see how clever you are, Peter Murphy. Can you press share on this? He probably can't. He's probably at the gym or something like that, or he's stressing, but he'd be smiling, I'm sure. So uh, anybody that's watching this, if you could share it for us, please, uh, we would really appreciate it because um, we want to try and get the word out about Murph's race this weekend. And that's one of the reasons why I'm talking with Jonathan this morning. What time is it in New Zealand and where are you? Um, it's 11.22, and I am in the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, we're waiting to race here at Rupuna Speedway in Christchurch. Um, the weather looks a bit dicey, but I uh, can't wait to go racing. It's been a good last couple of weeks in the car, and, and uh, we're ready to go. How does a Californian end up living in the South Island of New Zealand? Is it love, Jonathan? Is that what's done this? What's going on? I question myself about that every day, but uh, yeah, no, we, we uh, being able to go racing in, in, in a sprint car year round uh, was the ultimate goal for me. Um, as Murph knows, and a lot of guys to make a living at it, you had to kind of spread your wings and, and find a ride where you could used to go to Australia quite a bit. And and then of course, that's where I met you originally. Um, and we were in Sydney at one point and they brought the outlaws down under to New Zealand and we met a guy here and, and he bought a car originally from us. And, and so that's how the tie up originally happened. Um, while I was visiting Australia and racing there, he would have me come down here for a couple of weeks at a time. Um, and then I met the love of my life and, and decided to. Uh, um, if I, you know, COVID was a really hard period for us because if I left, I would not have been able to get back in because I'm not a, a citizen, um, per se of, of here. So, um, it was hard to leave and I definitely didn't want to leave because I thought she might find somebody better, but, uh, no, so no. we just stayed down here and, and fortunately through that time period, I mean, there's, there's always blessings and things that happen and they all happen for a reason, um, that's where Dalton's reached out to me because uh, Pete couldn't come down with somebody and, and they reached out to me as being a foreigner that was here. Um, and we got tied up and started racing together. And, and it really, um, it's been a, a change in my life. That's been wonderful to have. And, and the consistency of this team is, is with the Dalton's family. It's, it's uh, like I used to be in the zero with Maury and, and Pete and I, have been through so many rides together and, and, and in a, in a way that we share a lot of things together and, and 
Pete's come from, uh, you know, a small town in, in Sydney and um, yeah. made a living of it. And, and really, I took a lot of things from Pete and a lot of advice, and he's still giving it today. Doug Clark has just tuned in to watch. My friend Brian Stickle, who owns the Atlantic and Pacific Pub in Knoxville, Iowa, uh, is tuned in as well. Rick Slatter. Murph tells me he's filling up the water truck. That's a good sign. That's what we want to see, that kind of uh, thing as well. So whether it's dark where you are, whether you've got the candles on or whether you are in the brilliant sunshine filling up the water truck, it's um, it's great to uh, have all of your company and you're tuning in with Jonathan Allard. It's incredible, um, Jonathan, how you just throw out these New Zealand terms. Like, you know how to say all those incredible cities that I can't pronounce. Was it Ra Raapuna you're going to tonight? Yes. Yeah. So Ruapuna Speedway is, uh, it's taken me quite a while to be able to say these things, and I guess <laughs> just from being down here, but um, it's just outside of Christchurch, and and it's um, a staple really of South Island racing. Um, where I live up in the North Island is just outside of Auckland, um, and that's where, where Western Springs is, and we've been going through a tough time with Western Springs, whether it's going to shut or open or shut or, you know, they, they keep... Uh, Bring it along, but it's nice to see that it was back open and we've got another year to go up there before they make another decision. So um, it'll be nice to get back to racing up there. But here in the South Island, Christchurch is really the hub of racing down here. And this uh, speedway has been through its ups and downs and definitely right now it's on its upswing. Um, they've got a really good group of guys together that are working really hard at it. And you can tell the stands are full and the racing's fun down here and some good competitive cars and Got Joel Myers Jr. from California. He's he's going to be here this weekend, and uh, you know all the local guys, Jamie Duff, and and some of these guys. The good car. So Michael Pickens will be here, and myself, and so it'll be a fun race. The uh, I don't think many Americans understand just how massive the culture is at Western Springs, in particular. The crowds, particularly over the international season, and people might be surprised to know that. And I say this with respect. I think midget racing is the number one sport. Uh, in New Zealand, sprint cars everywhere else on the planet are generally number one and midget sit or speed cars sit just yep. in that number two spot. But wow, in uh, in Western Springs in particular, the midget culture, you're getting 15, 20,000 people to events. It's amazing. The atmosphere is like nowhere else I've been. It's like being in a stadium with gladiators and uh, um, it's still really neat. And, and to have the open pit area that's really different from at home um you buy one pass and and you're open to the stands and pits and you can wander through all night uh there's no driving through the pits you have to be pushed through the pits um a little bit difficult at times you know when you get used to working out of the trailer and that kind of thing you have to unload every week uh but the atmosphere is incredible um it's somewhere you know one of my childhood heroes of course and i think everybody that's into racing aj Foyt uh raced at western springs and that's pretty neat to me to to be able to race somewhere that to to a guy that I look up to and have looked up to uh, to be able to race there, you know. And Tony Stewart's been there, and Kyle Larson, all these guys uh, that had come and go through there. It's a really neat atmosphere to be right in the middle of the city. Um, yeah. It's just it's something special. Jonathan, um, I don't know how many Americans have seen the the Haka, but I don't think there's anything more truly intense and even emotional even as a non-kiwi it makes me emotional watching the way that the haka is done can you explain to some of your american friends right now what a haka war dance is well i guess it's something that prepared them to go into war um you know and 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 thinking about that to see it at sporting events is pretty chilling um you know to dance to warm their body up and and get them mentally and spiritually in the mood to to go and put their life on the line and and really uh it's it's a really to watch it uh is is kind of like for us everybody standing up for the national anthem and and saluting and and it's their way of saluting themselves and their country and and putting country first and you know to to be from the states and and have the national anthem playing it gives me the chills and and all my forefathers that uh put themselves on the line in war and and let us be able to do this special thing and without our military guys busting their butts we wouldn't be here and be able to do it so it's a salute to them and i think the hawk is a bit the same for new zealand you know australia and new zealand have a fierce sporting rivalry like it's just, i assume it's like america and canada 
Um, but we we kind of almost hate each other on the sporting field. But the respect that we have on one day in particular, Anzac Day, which is the Australian New Zealand, you know, um, Army Corps. Um, every year, one day a year, we stand together and uh, we always claim the best New Zealanders like um, Keith Urban and, you know, Russell Crowe and, you know, all those Hollywood actors and great singers and stuff. We have a way of doing that. It's a beautiful country, isn't it, Jonathan? Like um, everyone talks about, you know, the islands and the snow and the, the incredible different cultures that you have over there. What I see here um, reminds me, especially the South Island, reminds me a bit of Northern California. It's it's still a bit rugged. Um Really, I mean, from the main cities, it's it's developed in the you know the two three big cities we got here. But uh, from town to town, it's still the old school Kiwi way and and the old farmers, which I really love. You know, I'm I'm a farm boy myself and and love to get dirty and and that's probably why I race. But uh, it's really the Kiwi ingenuity because it, it, there's nothing down here and and you know to get parts and pieces is not that easy and. And they make so many neat things and come up with inventions that uh, you don't see. You know, like Bill Buckley from BSL makes one of the most. Uh, he's he's the guy that cuts all the computer chips in the world with the magnets in them, and he developed a way to do it. And and just some of the things that the people come up with here are, are really neat to see. And and the ingenuity and still hammering tongs and and still doing it on the tools. So it's pretty neat. One of my very favorite movies on the planet is the world's fastest Indian, uh, Jonathan. And you know what I love the most about it? And I tell people that Aussies that have never been to America, and I tell Americans that have never been to Australia, the way that the uh, Bonneville people treat Bert Munro as a complete stranger and they welcome him into their family, that is the way that Aussies get treated by Americans. And it makes me very emotional because those, those people are adopted that crazy old guy just purely because he was a bit different they they didn't know much about where he was from but they thought let's get around this guy and that's the way our three countries america new zealand and australia we have this incredible racing bond don't we yeah i would say racing has brought a lot of different people from different back backgrounds together and i would say that you know same thing with australia when i came over everybody welcomed me here in new zealand um it really is a neat bond, whether you come from uh, an engineering background or the dirt, you know, from the farm or it's one thing and it's a passion and one thing everybody's into is racing. And and to have that, um, you know, I went down to Burt Monroe, the, the museum down there and, and saw what oh, they wow. did with and it was it's incredible to to see the hand poured pistons and the parts and pieces. And I think everybody respects that ingenuity and that determination yeah, and really, sprint car racing and open wheel racing, I still see that it's all grit and determination. Even if you have the big rigs and the feather lights and the, it still takes a lot of determination and a lot of skill. And uh, you know, I think everybody respects that. And and the one thing I like is you see it in the work area at home. You know, when people have problems, um, all the teams come around. You know, when I was racing the outlaw show, show a couple of years ago i had a problem and and uh, sheldon hot and charles team all came around and and threw the front end back in and away we went and uh it just shows you the the passion that everybody has and i think uh you have your problems i mean everybody gets into a bit of a problem once in a while and has strife but we all love the same thing um i wonder it, it should they should have a lemon tree at the back of the burt Monroe museum and you should have to go and pee on it before you uh if you haven't seen the movie i'm going to tell you now you need to watch it a great friend of yours and mine uh jan mcmahon is tuned in watching she says hi jonathan hi wade um so cool that paul's finally been inducted into the uh sprint car hall of fame um we talked yesterday i was talking with dominic selsey about all the incredible californian sprint car races a lot of people forget the mcmahon brothers were pretty stout in california back in the day weren't they well paul was definitely on his game when when i first started and without paul i probably would not have got into a sprint car he was one of the ones that pushed the the first guy that i drove for steve tatum um in orville california uh, paul was working for him and he pushed him to put me in the car and and so without Paul, you know, who knows what would have been, but uh, it's very special to me. Jan, Jan was always around the races and I, I like to think uh, maybe I helped them get together. So oh, uh, yeah, great family and, and Paul's always been there. Paul was always one of the guys you looked up to. He raced really hard qualifier, good qualifier, good hard racer and something, somebody definitely that I looked up to. 
So you won the first ever Peter Murphy Classic, which is the reason why we're catching up today. It's on this Saturday night, $11,000 to win at King Speedway in the Hanford Fairgrounds. And Murph, a lot of people forget he's still so entrenched in Australia. He still uses the WSFM radio station in his workshop, so he knows the traffic in Sydney every morning, and he still does that Friday night in Speedway night. He loves doing his uh, his Aussie uh, mimics of the ads uh, you have a friendship with him that goes way back. Where did it start? Well, I've met Murph uh, when when we were racing around California. He was he was in the Maury Williams car and and uh, you know a car that I ultimately ended up settling in as well. And uh, Murph and I, Murphy's always been a great competitor. Um, Pete Pete uh, is a very good competitor, a very good coach, a good mentor, somebody that you like to lean on. And I was telling you earlier, um, you know. When we go through California racing history, you know, you, as a young kid without uh, the money to back yourself and, and put your own cars together, we would have to fight for rides. And and you could very seldom share with people what was going on and, and really have somebody to lean on. And Pete was that for me um, when I needed some advice away from um, the, you know, glitz and glam of what you were going to next or uh, if you just needed somebody to talk things through with without uh, judgment, Pete was that guy. Um, and he still is for me. You know, um, I get a lot of advice from him. I get uh, a lot of mentorship. And and really, he's come over the last couple of uh, races over here when he's been here. He's been uh, a crew chief, uh, uh, helps build the cars, helps mentor me, helps get the car owner on board. Um, he's very involved with what's going to come up for me in the U.S. coming up uh, in a couple of months. So, we still relate to each other really well. Um, when he had his accident, it was very tough for me. Um, we got out of the car and and I just was not really interested in racing um, the rest of that night until we knew that Pete was okay somewhat at the hospital. Um, I, I lied my butt off to get into the hospital to make sure I got to hold his hand until somebody was there, you know, until his wife came. Um, I was right by his side. Um, and so we've got a special bond, you know, like I said, he's always been there to lean on and he's a good person and he wants the best for you, best for racing and best for everybody around. So, yeah. There was a video I saw yesterday uh, on the Peter Murphy Classic page and I think on the NARC page as well from 2015 and they interviewed a number of drivers about why it was special. And one of the names in particular, I just went, oh, wow, it was Jason Statler, uh, you know, I can't even imagine what went through Jason Statler's mind, you know, in that moment. And, and then after it, of course, because Jason was the last car in, unfortunately, that struck Peter when his car was already stationary. Um, boy, it, I remember in Australia, we didn't have a grasp of just how serious his injuries were. Uh, it was rattling around, you know, oh, my God, oh, my God, Murph's had a big one, but not anywhere near the extent of, you know, what that might mean that it was going to be the end of his career. He cares so much that it worries me he cares too much. And I think he gets he gets um, hurt by not everybody rowing the boat in the same way, Jonathan. As a promoter now, he's he's so receptive to public feedback and to driver feedback. And as you know, he takes everything to heart. So that's probably his only kryptonite is he cares so much, doesn't he? Well, Pete's a personal guy and uh, everything is personal to him and he's a perfectionist and he wants it perfect for everybody, not for himself, not for um, per se his group of people, but for the competitor because he's been that competitor and uh, he wants to make sure every competitor gets their best chance to win and be successful. And that's why he's happy for everybody when they go out there and win. You know, he's one of the first ones up there giving them a hug and, and celebrating with them because you know, he knows what that, how much effort people put in. So he puts the same amount of effort in, if not more than he would have as a competitor um, to try to give the guys what they need in a racetrack. And that doesn't always work. And um, unfortunately, he takes it personal when, when guys have something to say. And it seems like uh, that that's become the norm is having something to say. And it's not always uh, a positive thing. Um, everybody's quiet when it's positive, but when it's negative, there's a lot to be said. And, and Pete hears a lot of that, but, uh, you know, um, he's leaned on us uh, about that. And, and I keep telling him that, uh, you're only one guy doing your best. And, and that's a lot more than most, um, you know, he is doing his best and he's doing his best to rally his troops around and give everybody what they deserve. You know, last year at the end of the year, he had a really bad, uh, battle with the fairgrounds about, 
the racetrack and and some of the stuff of the equipment at Hanford and and he took that soul on board himself and and wasn't able to get some of the equipment and then everybody bailed on him and and I really felt bad for Pete personally because uh, he took it all on his shoulders and and I don't think that was fair as some of the competitors were really hard on him and and uh, I know we all put in a lot of effort and but Pete tries to keep it all together himself and doesn't always communicate what's going on because he's trying to be a perfectionist and and keep everybody happy. But that's why we love him. You know, he's 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 a guy that cares and and somebody you can lean on and rely on. And and to go back to his accident, uh, you know, I don't think any of us realized how how serious the the injuries were when we got to the hospital. Um, you know, I was sitting there on the bed talking to him and and thought everything was great and and uh, not not great, but thought he was OK and everything was in a positive direction. And we went out and, and started our drive home and, and then got the call that things went downhill pretty quickly um, just because of the swelling. And I think there's a lot of education there for, for all, all of us uh, in those times of disaster. You never know when and what and where. And thank God we can we can talk to Pete now. But uh, it was pretty dicey there for a while. So we're all pretty lucky to have him. Yeah, and we'll never really know which brain damage was before or after the crash. I mean, let's face it, Jonathan, he's always been a little tapped. Well, definitely. Um, I think he did gain some smarts. It, it rattled some things together. And so now it's not so, so short circuited, but uh, he's always been very entertaining and he's a bit loose in the head. So that's why uh, he's always on for a smile. He can put you in a great mood. I love our community, mate. Uh, Brandon Wimmer is on here. Brandon just said, Jonathan was a mentor to me when I first started racing on the West Coast. Him and his brother were always there to help me. I love that the very next person watching is Jody Hewitt, which means there's a good possibility that Jody and Jack Hewitt are watching uh, as well. You're right. Um, before Jan McMahon said that you basically gave Paul her phone number. Isn't it, isn't it beautiful, mate? Back in the day, you had to give someone a phone number to contact him. You couldn't just send him a Snapchat or a TikTok or a I really, I really miss that for my sons. They just don't have that old school way of connecting like we had to do it as people, didn't we? Yeah, I think uh, I think we were talking about it the other day, just waiting for the the open wheel to come in and see see Jack Hewitt. I mean, I had more pictures. I have more pencil drawings of Jack Hewitt's car than anybody else. Cause really? I that car, you know, um, when he won the four crown, all those cars, I, I used to dream of having a car with Jet Star on the side or, or whatever that was. But, um, you know, he was a hero of mine and, and to open up the open wheels and, and see his face and, and the cars he raced and, and the kind of person he is. Um, he's one of those that's full of passion and, and such a nice person in person to meet and uh, such a wonderful hero. But on the track, he was an absolute animal and somebody that uh, you wanted to be. He was the hero and he still is. But um, yeah, it's pretty special. Um, the, you know, the old telephone numbers and phone calls and and uh, how things were. I'm glad I grew up when I did. I mean, it's uh, it's things are totally different now, but it's led to us all talking on on this device here and, and being able to speak over three different continents. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it absolutely is. Jody just commented, caught me, which is what we like. I like that we can sort of, uh, you know, sneak people out and find that they're watching. And you're right. We have the world has become smaller. There are some positives um, from the pandemic experience. It did it did open up this platform because we never did this before COVID. Nobody did Zooms. Nobody worked from home. Nobody had Facebook Lives. So we have been able to close down the continent a little bit. Mate, um, when will you be back in California? Um, do you go back each year? How does that work for you? Well, with the blessing of uh, being a part of the Dalton's team, um, they've given me a bit of leeway of going back. Uh, the last couple of years, I got back in the zero car, but uh, they have a little bit more of a heavy duty schedule than I could achieve with, with what I was doing at the time. I'm kind of on the semi-retirement plan, I would say. I'm still racing pretty much every weekend, but uh, we're just kind of back and forth and really racing to enjoy what I what I've been able to do and and just be associated with the right people. Um, so with that being said, uh, they put Tim Kading in the car, which is great for them. But uh, we're going to come back probably in a couple of months here, I would say, and and really hit Skagit and and kind of race around from there, and then. Um, come back home for a bit, get things built up for next year, and then go back in, in California and race towards the end of the year, all the high limits and outlaw stuff at the end of the year. So mm. I'm really 
forward to it, but it's going to be a scaled down version, which is quite simple for me. Um, it makes it easy for everyone. And hopefully Pete's involved in that, um, being able to get things organized for us over there. So uh, it'll be a great tie up. He's uh, of course, heavily involved in Skagit um, as well as Hanford. Typical Pete is 1000 kilometers per hour all the time. His beautiful wife, Steph, I don't know how she remotely keeps up with him. Him starting at the gym at four o'clock in the morning and, you know, flying between two different States. Super cool how his boys have grown up too, mate. One in particular is outstanding in the theatrical um, world, and that one's a pretty handy little racer. I'm pretty sure he's racing this weekend. So I know he's immensely proud of his family, Jonathan. Yeah, it's, uh, they both definitely take after Steph in the smarts department. But uh, <laughs> as you know, um, with Pete, if, they, if you're lucky enough to have a few beers with him, and, and really you can see the theatrics, and that's uh, – both them boys are taking after dad in that department, but uh, yeah, it's good to see um, both of them around and, and how successful they've been through life. And, and Pete's really, you know, he's a good family, man. He cares about everybody really, but uh, his family is very important to him. And, and it's special to see him be able to hang out with both them boys. And, you know, I've known them since they were born and, and uh, it's neat to see them all growing up now. Jonathan, I want you to understand, if you can, that you are still such an adored and loved and respected figure in our sport. Um, I know you live in a re remote corner of the world, even more remote in some ways than Australia, um, but people don't forget. Um, and whenever they think of, you know, badass gases from the West Coast that, you know, have made an incredible career and not only that, being a great person, you are tremendously respected, mate. And I know it's just reflected in the people that are, that are watching this at the moment and commenting. Everybody has a great story. So you are the the New Zealand slash California version of Peter Murphy. I want you to remember that. Well, it's very humbling to hear that. Uh, that's one thing that that's very important to me is is the legacy we leave behind and, and really to, I guess, help young racers succeed and keep the sport alive is very important to me. Um, a lot of people question the, the amount of information I give out and help people, but uh, it's important to me to do that because uh, without the help that I receive from guys like Jimmy Seals and Brent Cading and all the, the heroes of Paul McMahon's and, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here definitely without them. So it's important to me to pass that legacy on and, and uh, it's very humbling to hear that. Thank you. All right. Before we go, tell me the story about your first, the first ever Peter Murphy classic and how you won it. Cause it's a great story. Well, we were we we had a good car. We were fast, but uh, we were kind of mired in the middle and and struggling a bit. And uh, you know, as as you say, with with Pete being who he is, um, he I, I called him over. I think we had a red and, and called him over, and and he actually gave me a few pointers and tips to to really think about where the wing was at on the car and and the bump rubber height and some of that stuff and. And I've always leaned on Pete for information, but not really set up stuff. And and uh, he really helped change the race car in that race. And I think we went from sixth or seventh up to the lead, and it was right on the fence. And and you know how Tulare gets uh, out of two up on the fence. And I think without that information, I would not have been able to place the car where it was. And we were lucky enough to ride into the lead. And and there was some stuff that happened with the leader. I think Kyle Hurst was leading at the time, and and he tangled up with somebody. But uh, to win that race was really one of the highlights of my career because just because of the friendship and the way it went with Pete getting in the accident, and that was the very first one, and to have my name at the top of that trophy is very special to me. I remember the hole in turn one when I think about Tulare, Jonathan. My God, my first look at Peter Murphy Classic, I like, boom, gone. Hmm. That's interesting. Boom, gone. It was like in qualifying, people were flipping. Yeah, Tulare's one of those uh, special places that if you can master it, it feels pretty good and it feels like an achievement. So I've been through that hole many times and I've been out of the park there many times. Uh, some <laughs> of my big, biggest crashes have come from there, but uh, it really makes you feel like you've accomplished something if you win a race. And to, to do that with the Peter Murphy Classic and to have mm. to be the first one is like I said, a career highlight for me. Keith Ophill was just tuned in as well. I know that uh, Keith and Kim Ophill, the Ophill family, put an enormous amount into sprint car racing as well. And, of course, their friendship with the McCall family sees that car, the 88 car, which is iconic. There's so That's what I love about our sport, Jonathan. You know, there's so many iconic cars, isn't there? Well, I was fortunate enough to race for Keith and Kim and, and uh, Weld and Ophill there for a bit. I was uh, employed by them to work on Kyle's car, and Kyle was a good 
racer coming up and and uh he stepped aside and and now they put mccarl in it and austin is a true badass in the sport and uh to see him in that car it's pretty special that car has always been one of those special staple cars that needs to be out there and uh, i think we ran second at the, the one of the peter murphy classics uh when i was in that car and man what a special blessing that was that was a fast race car uh, so this is going to be the perfect way to round things out. Paul McMahon says, love you, J.A. And that's a great way to round out my chat with Jonathan Allard. I could do this with you for hours, mate. Can we do this again later in the year, please, and just talk about life? Let's do it. I can't wait. Thank you for having me on. And uh, I love you too, Paul. Thanks for everything. Good on you, mate. The wonderful Jonathan Allard. So good to talk with him here today in promoting the Peter Murphy Classic, brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. They always had that uh, that love you, man, that ad back in the day. I think that's kind of appropriate. We're all getting together to talk with our friends. This Saturday at King Speedway, fingers crossed the weather does the right thing by Murph and everybody. 11 grand to win. The King of the West Sprint Car Series will be there. I think he has uh, IMCA cars there as well. Going to be a fantastic one-night affair. Good luck tonight, J.A. Thank you. Hopefully uh, we can report some good news at the end of the night. Yeah, let's make sure that you do that, mate. Great to talk to you. Jonathan Allard, get around the Peter Murphy Classic. He's got his own Facebook page, the Peter Murphy Classic Facebook page as well. Plus, of course, King Speedway. And get across uh, Skagit as well. It's going to be a monster meeting as well for that this year. Thanks, J.A.